Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth of our Key Opinion Leader webinars. Um, uh, today we have uh, our speaker, Mr. Christian Ingle. Uh, so I'd like to introduce him first of all. You can say hello, Christian. Hello. <laughs> and uh, we'll just, uh, there we go, perfect. <laughs> just to say hello, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'd just like to do a bit of a, an introduction uh, to Mr. Ingle and uh, his work. Um, so he's a consultant hip and knee arthroplasty surgeon at the Sophia Hemet Hospital uh, in North, Northern Stockholm, uh, which is where he joins us from today. Um, he left the Swedish National Health Sales System in 2019, having worked at the Söderskjut Huset Hospital, or Southern General Hospital, excuse my terrible pronunciation, uh, in Stockholm, uh, where he was a senior consultant, uh, mainly conducting uh, revision hip and knee surgery, and he has a special interest in periprosthetic uh, joint infections and surgical treatment uh, of major bone loss. Um, so a little bit of information uh, about Mr. Ingle, um, but what I'd like to do as well um, is just go, go through a few uh, housekeeping uh, information just to, to give you information on uh, about the webinar. Um, so uh, the way that you communicate with us uh, is through the um, Q&A function. So if you have questions, please put them through the, the, the Q&A function. Um, if they don't get answered straight away, we'll do our best to come back to them. But as you can appreciate, there can be quite a few. So uh, we may come back to them uh, at a later date if there's lots. There is a chat function, but please, if questions can mainly go through the, the Q&A, that would be appreciated. Um, the whole thing is recorded. So if you look on our YouTube channel, uh, as you can see at the bottom, they go on the Osser Academy YouTube channel. So all of our previous webinars are on there. This is the fourth. Um, so there are a few. Uh, on there, um, as well as historic ones. Um, we are sending out e-certificates. Um, a few of you have messaged me in the last uh, few minutes just to say that you have perhaps haven't received all the ones from the sessions that you've attended. We've, we've had to automate this process just because you can appreciate we've had upwards of 1,500 uh, certificates that we need to send out. So one or two may have uh, slipped the net. So um, if you can email eventsne at osser.com, uh, just saying uh, which one you're missing, if at all, um, then we will sort that out. Um, we will also be following up the session uh, with, a, with a questionnaire and also we'll be sharing the references from today um, in that as well. Um, I will be trying to put the, the references in the chat function as we go through, but as you're about to see uh, in Mr. Ingle's presentation, there's one or two references. So if I don't keep up, uh, my apologies on that. Um, so uh, only really remains uh, for me to uh, pass over to Mr. Ingle uh, and uh, for him to, to start his pres presentation. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon to all of you uh, from uh, quite cloudy Stockholm. Um, it was uh, sunny until recently, but now everything is normal in, as it is in, in spring in Stockholm. It's cold and it's cloudy and it's almost raining. Uh, I hope everybody is um, fine, that all your family and friends are, are healthy and, and uh, um, good in these uh, indeed strange times. Um, we, what I thought about talking today is uh, the painful uh, non-traumatic disorders of the hip. And being an arthroplasty surgeon, I will mostly, and I will talk about osteoarthritis and then the borderline diseases leading to osteoarthritis, the patients uh, presenting um, with, uh, mostly it's pain they are presenting to us, and um, the x-rays sometimes normal, sometimes not. Um, what can cause pain in the hip? Uh, we have the ITB, the ileal tibial band friction syndrome, the trochanteritis, the bursitis, the trochanteric bursa, the ileopsoas bursa, the ischiogluteal bursa. We have the extra articular impingement, the trochanteric pelvic impingement. We have then the, uh, the snapping hips, the internal snapping hip, the external snapping hip, which is uh, a kind of a variant of the ITB friction syndrome. We have the, uh, the tendinopathies, um, stress fractures, of course. We have avascular necrosis. We have chondral defects. 
we have um, more um, intra-articular um, problems of the synovia, the, the pigmented bilionodular synovitis, uh, and we have, of course, uh, neurological disorders, pain from, from derived from the, the lumbar uh, nerve roots one to three that um, sometimes can mimic uh, hip pain. Uh, and then, of course, we have osteoarthritis, which is uh, quite a common problem. And we have the idiopathic osteoarthritis, where we actually don't know where it comes from. And then we have the um, osteoarthritis because of a development dysplasia of the hip. Uh, and we have um, the big complex of, of a problem of problems uh, under the uh, under the headline of the femoral acetabular impingement. Um, what I'm going to try to talk about is um, osteoarthritis. I will have a, a brief introduction. I will uh, go through the etiology of uh, idiopathic uh, femoral acetabular impingement of uh, development dysplasia of the hip. We will go through clinical and uh, radiographic evaluation, treatment options, and then because it's such a, um, a great part of my, my daily practice, hip prosthesis and sport, because it's just something that, that um, interests me uh, personally, because uh, there are so many um, patients um, I mean, participating in sports before uh, the hip surgery and want to participate in sports after the hip surgery. And um, when I was working for the, the, um, the Swedish equivalent to the NHS, I was mostly dealing with, um, with revisions and, and uh, young patients with, with severe um, morphology, um, um, severe morphologies in their hips and knees. Uh, now, when I'm in private practice, I'm, I'm, uh, the, the, uh, the focus of my work has uh, changed quite a bit and I'm seeing a lot of these younger patients now who are um, active at a very high level and who have very high demands uh, um, before and after the surgery. Uh, ulcerated cartilage is a troublesome thing once destroyed is not repaired. Um, that's your own William Hunter who published uh, of the structure and disease of articulated cartilage in 1743 in his philosophical transaction. And actually, it's a little bit depressing, but we have not been, uh, we, we have not been, we have not been coming really longer than he said, once the, the cartilage is destroyed in the hip or in the knee or in, in the other um, joint, uh, it is a troublesome thing because it is destroyed and it cannot be repaired even if we try to, and there's a lot of research going on, but, but we are still there that we can't really replace, especially osteoarthritis uh, destroyed cartilage. Um, the global burden of hip and knee osteoarthritis. Hip and knee osteoarthritis is a serious condition. Uh, in there are, um, every year there is um, a, a um, a publication which is uh, called the global burden of diseases uh, and they rank diseases um, um, according to their um, how do you call it on the impact on, on people's everyday life and the, this is a special uh, publication uh, which came out in 2010 who emphasis on hip and knee osteoarthritis and of the in 2010 um, in uh, the the um, um, this publication was actually in 2013. But of the uh, 200, 291 conditions contributing to global disability, uh, hip and knee osteoarthritis was ranked 11th. And this is the, it's actually um, in concurrence with, um, with cancer, with um, cardiovascular diseases, with dementia. Um, years lived with disabilities rose from 10.5 million years in 1990 to 17. 0.5 million in uh, 2010. That's almost a doubling, or it's at least 40% um, increase in years lived with disabilities in uh, in 10 in 20 years. And the um, they have estimated the global age standardized prevalence of uh, osteoarthritis of the hip to 0.85%. Uh, that maybe doesn't sound much, but I mean we have now six. Uh, billions of people on earth, it's quite a lot of people 
who are suffering from hip osteoarthritis and for knee osteoarthritis it's actually 3.8 percent and we have a high higher preva, uh, prevalence in in females than in in males and the prevalence is rising um, they are due to uh, that's what we assume due to increasing um, risk factors or the, due to increasing um, the prevalence of the risk factors uh, we have obesity uh, um, above all we have the globally all age obesity increased by 26 percent from uh, 2000 to 2013 in 2014 we had uh, 39 percent of all adults all over the world age 18 and plus were overweight with a BMI between 25 and 29, which is more than 1. billion people. And 13% of the, the, um, the population of our planet were obese with a BMI above 35. Um, that's over 600 million people. Physical inactivity is rising, especially in the Western countries. Um, uh, and there is an, a strong association with physical uh, inactivity with muscle weakness and which is a separate risk factor for, for developing osteo osteoarthritis. And then joint injuries um, are actually uh, on the rise as well. And it is probably um, because of, of the increased uh, participation in, in sports activities. Uh, and then there's a lot of question marks. There's a lot of uh, still questions to be answered why the, uh, um, the, the prevalence of osteoarthritis is rising. Um, these are two tables uh, from the, the British, from the um, uh, United Kingdom uh, National Joint Registry and from the Swedish Hip Arthroplasty um, Registry. We can see the, the, uh, the numbers of uh, total hip replacement annually performed. And from 2003 in, in, uh, in um, Great Britain uh, until now, it has been, it has gone up from uh, um, a little bit over 20,000 to almost 90,000 now. In Sweden, we have not had um, a similar increase in numbers, but we have a, a steady rise in, in hip procedures as well. Uh, osteoarthritis is a serious um, disease. Um, there is a substantial persistent morbidity um, associated with uh, um, osteoarthritis, and we think it is mediated through pain, fatigue, sleep disturbances, depression, and disability. It's an enormous burden on people's uh, act uh, activity of daily living and quality of life. Um, there is an increased uh, risk um, for patients with, osteo with severe osteoarthritis uh, for progression of cardiometabolic diseases, uh, and that is probably due to impaired physical activities. There is a substantial economic burden uh, of osteoarthritis, direct cost as a uh, treatment cost, surgery cost, caregiver time, and then there is a lot of indirect cost, which is actually quite difficult to measure, loss of productivity, sick leave, uh, premature mort mortality. Um, mortality, speaking of mortality, this is a 2019 um, um, publication that um, actually um, puts the, the mortality rates of um, rheumatoid arthritis and other mus muscular uh, skeletal diseases um, uh, with uh, osteoarthritis being the most prevalent uh, up to 1.6 times higher compared to general populations. And um, it is probably not so that osteoarthritis is not um, an, an, a cause of an increased mortality. So the, 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 the disease osteoarthritis is not causing an increase in mortality but what is increasing the mortality rates is uh, probably disability, pain, and the increase in, in comorbidities that patients with osteoarthritis have difficulties in dealing with their comorbidities. Then there is some data that is shown that even the overuse of uh, enzyme products for treating uh, osteoarthritis may be one of the causes um, um, for the, the increased mortality rates. But, uh, um, and um, and as you as you all know, probably as you probably all know that the uh, the the NSAID drugs uh, increase the risk of of uh, cardiopulmonary events, especially in in uh, in patients with uh, cardiopulmonary um, uh, comorbidities. 
And there is data, there's a lot of data now suggesting that addressing the above could potentially decrease the mortality rates uh, um, which are associated with osteoarthritis. Um, Idiopathic osteoarthritis, that means that we uh, don't know why these patients get their osteoarthritis. And the osteoarthritis is not just uh, ulcerated cartilage. It is, uh, it, it, and I think we should see it as a disorder of the whole joint organ. It is not only affecting the cartilage, even if it often starts with the cartilage, but it is affecting the underlying bone, the ligament, and all the surrounding muscles of the joint. Uh, all our joints are um, they are lined with hyaline cartilage, um, which is um, uh, consist, uh, which consists of chondrocytes, which are the the living material in our cartilage, and then we have the extracellular matrix, uh, and this is mainly consisting of large proteoglycans and being agricane and collagen, the the two um, most important and the two most uh, frequent one. And um, there are no uh, blood vessels in, in the joint, so water from the joint, uh, from the synovial fluid, is captured, released, and recaptured in between these macromolecules of the large proteoglycans uh, when compressive force is applied. And that means that uh, the, the cartilage is, is working as a, uh, as a sponge, Ella, similar to a sponge when we walk or when we, uh, when we exercise, when we uh, um, so that it will compress and it will, uh, the synovial fluid, the water will leave the, the, the cartilage and then when we, um, when we release the compressive forces then it will uh, suck water and synovial fluid in, into it and that's how the chondrocyte get their, uh, uh, get their nutrition. Um, when hyaline cartilage is destroyed, uh, then we uh, form uh, something that we call fibrous cartilage, which is not the same. You can call it a scar cartilage, and it's not the same mechanical properties as hyaline uh, cartilage has, which is one of the problems um, that we, we can't really replace hyaline cartilage with something else that works as good as hyaline, uh, hyaline cartilage does. Um, what is OASN? Osteoarthritis is the loss of the structural integrity of the cartilage. Uh, it is a, a senescence of chondrocytes and it is a degradation of, prote of proteoglycans. And that leads to decreased uh, shock absorbent properties. It leads uh, to an increased uh, sensitivity to load and strain. And what we see in the, in the joint in the cartilage is first softening, then fibrillation, ulceration, and then exposure of the, uh, of the subchondral bone. Uh, sclerosis, and this is if the osteoarthritis then develops even more, uh, progresses even more, uh, scler sclerosis of the uh, subchondral bone, uh, the uh, formation of osteophytes, um, so new bone formations, cysts in, in, in the uh, subchondral bone, and uh, ligament insufficiency and muscle weakness. Uh, as I mentioned, what, what is, where does the pain in, in osteoarthritis come from? As I said, there is no blood vessels and there is no nerves in the cartilage. What is it that actually hurts when the people, uh, when, when our patients have osteoarthritis? Uh, and it's definitely uh, synovitis and capsulitis in inflammation in the synovia and in the capsula and in the surrounding soft tissues of the joint. And then it's most likely an overload of the sub subchondral bone because of the uh, the loss of the um, um, the um, uh, the load distribution uh, ability of the the cartilage. Uh, these are atroscopic um, pictures, actually not from a hip, from a knee, because it's much easier to to see. But you can see down there, it's a soft, and you can see the uh, the atroscopic ho hook is actually uh, going into the cartilage. It's soft, which is not supposed to be. And then you have the fibrillation at the top. There are, it looks a little bit like seaweed hanging down from, from the femur. And then the next station, you have the ulceration on the femur, which is the, the, the part, the yellow part on, on the top of the picture. And then you have there in the back, you have an erosion with exposed uh, subchondral bone.
Uh, and this is what, what um, uh, osteoarthritis, idiopathic, idiopathic osteoarthritis looks on the x-ray. You can see here, it, it's almost the same in both, but you can see here, there's no cartilage left. There's no joint space left. It's an x-ray. We can't actually see the, the cartilage. Um, but you can see the, the, the sclerosis of the subconval bone. You can see the formation of, of osteophytes here and here and down here. Um, why do we get osteoarthritis? Uh, there are some other, there are a lot of risk factors for idiopathic osteoarthritis. There's heredity. Um, um, so if your parents have osteoarthritis, then uh, there is a, a higher risk that you get it. Uh, gender, as I said, females are more um, prone to osteoarthritis than male. It looks like that. Age, it is in, in a disease of, of uh, how do you say, the second half of your lifetime ethnicity. We have a lot of osteoarthritis in the Nordic countries. The African countries have a lot less. Uh, overweight is a big problem and is a big uh, contributor to uh, the the the, the um, development of, of uh, idiopathic osteoarthritis. There is a stronger association with overweight and knee osteoarthritis, but there still is an association between hip osteoarthritis and overweight. Muscle weakness uh, due to physical inactivity and then injury, as I, um, as I mentioned. Uh, of course, if you, if you get a fracture, you, you have a, a, a fracture of the femoral neck or something like this, then of course you are prone to, to develop uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis. But I'm talking more about the, 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 the minor um, injuries uh, during sports activities or during work uh, leading to, to uh, fractures or, or uh, small injuries in, in the cartilage. Wait, sorry. Uh, evaluation of, of uh, osteoarthritis. History is enormously important, I think. I think just by talking and listening to the patients, you, you can almost be certain of the diagnosis, at least uh, some of the times. Uh, pain, uh, the pain history is, is uh, really important. When do the patients have pain? Do they have it in the morning? Do they, when they get active, does the pain is in, in the beginning of the activity and then it reduces and then, then can walk for quite a while, but it then comes back as post-activity pain uh, during the evening or during the next day, pain and rest, pain during night, uh, which is quite uh, um, a severe osteoarthritis when, the, when, when patients uh, develop in uh, developing uh, pain and rest and uh, pain during the night. Uh, clinical, clinical examination, we have the pain triggers, the, the, the people, uh, the patients, not the people, the patients with all the hip osteoarthritis will normally be, uh, uh, they will experience pain if you, if you palpate the groin like deeply. Um, we look at the range of motion, of course, as an arthroplasty surgeon, I look at the length, length, uh, leg length, uh, at least uh, before surgery. Uh, you have to look at the lumbar spine just to rule out that there's uh, uh, not uh, spine problems uh, mimicking uh, hip um, uh, hip disease. Uh, you have to look at the knee. And then we have the radiology. Uh, I think plain x-rays, uh, at least for the majority of, uh, of patients, the low-centered pelvic uh, x-ray and the lateral view, is, uh, is suffice perfectly to diagnosing osteoarthritis. And I think if it's osteoarthritis I'm, I'm looking for, I get very limited information from an MRI or from an CT um, for the diagnosis of osteoarthritis. Um, this is just um, some x-rays of a, a patient, um, and this is, more directed to my, my colleagues, um, that you have to have a look uh, at the x-rays on your own. Uh, this is a patient presented um, or was, uh, with their general practitioner with, uh, with the groin pain, uh, quite severe, and they took an x-ray and the radiologist said so that the hip looks fine and has a little bit of osteoarthritis, which you can see there's a lot of joint space here. Um, but you have a, a slight um, a sclerosis of the subchondral bone. Uh, and then um, she was complaining uh, about, um, about persistent pain and somebody did an MRI and they diagnosed her with an avascular um, necrosis of the, the left um, femoral head and, and they, um, um, they, they judged it not so severe. So they, they tried to, to um, 
um, to um, um, to treat her with uh, um, with uh, non weight bearing. She got uh, crouches and and uh, she got painkillers, and then she presented to us after five months after the first X-rays. And now you can see what she has is a, a severe osteoarthritis of the hip with a collapse of the femoral head uh, and Actually, this is not idiopathic uh, osteo uh, osteoarthritis. This is osteoarthritis due to an avascular necrosis. Uh, but just to to uh, to see that the the uh, the end, the X-rays at the end, they 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 almost always look the same. The people have a, a an insufficient um, and joint. Um, um, now we go away from uh, idiopathic um, um, uh, hip osteoarthritis and we um, um, go to other um, uh, reasons uh, to get osteoarthritis in the hip. This is a publication from 2011 from uh, Clohisi and uh, his uh, colleagues where they looked at um, uh, total hip replacement patients at their clinic. There were two um, big cohorts. Uh, all of the patients were uh, under the age of 50 and they had received a total hip replacement. Uh, and there were um, 373, no, <laughs> 337 um, uh, hips with osteoarthritis. Of these hips, there was 48% showed a sign of a development dysplasia of the hip. And then we had uh, 10%, uh, which were presenting with the uh, radiological signs of uh, Le Carrier Pertus disease, Pertus disease, the uh, pediatric disease of an avascular necrosis of a, tempora, um, a temporal uh, avascular necrosis of the femoral head. And then we had 6% um, with the diagnosis of a slipped capital femoral epiphysis. And then there, that left us with 121 hips, 36% uh, uh, where they had uh, uh, patients uh, with idiopathic hip osteoarthritis. What they did then is that they uh, got back to the, um, to the earliest possible x-rays and tried to see if they could find another um, reason as a not just degener degeneration of, of the joint, uh, if they could uh, find another reason for this. And I think we have a little poll here now um, what do you think of these 121 um, um, hips? In how many of these patients did, did they find um, um, radiological um, anomalies uh, consistent with uh, ephemeral, uh, ephemeral acetabular impingement? Um, less than 10%, less than 50%, less than 80%, or more than 80%? Okay, so people are just starting to vote. We have 20, 25%. So we'll give it another few seconds. Um, just to note that if you're joining from a browser uh, and you haven't used the app, um, these may or may not pop up. Um, so just to make you aware, we give that another few seconds. We're, we're up to pretty much 70%. There we go, I'll end it there and then share those results. So you can see, that people have answered uh, less than 10% was 10% uh, of people, uh, less than 50% is 41% of people, uh, less than 80% is 26% of people, and uh, greater than 80%, 23% of people uh, yeah. said that. And in, in, in this study, the right answer is that basically all of the patients except for three uh, showed um, signs, radiological signs of femoral acetabular impingement. Uh, so there were 63% chem type um, um, morphologies, 6% pincer type morphologies, and then 29% mixed times um, uh, morphology. And, and this shows us uh, that the, the, the concept of, of femoral, femoral acetabular impingement is probably one of the, the big causes of development uh, of the development of osteoarthritis in early ages as a, not the, the degenerative disease that, that normally occurs in, in, in patients older than 60 and 70. Um, the, uh, the concept of uh, femoral acetabular impingement is not new. It, uh, in, as early as in 1913, 
uh, two German uh, surgeons, Volpius and Stoffel, uh, described uh, open surgery um, due to chem morphology. And then you have uh, um, publications in 19. Uh, 30 from Smith Peterson in 1975, Stuhlberg describing the pistol grip deformity. Uh, and it's, it's the same principle, which is an impingement where, where you impinge the, uh, the femoral neck um, with the, 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 the rim of the acetabular uh, cavity. Uh, but they were describing um, probably not what we today would call a, an FRI. They were describing residuals after mostly pediatric hip diseases with like a slipped uh, a capital uh, femoral epiphysis or Pertis disease. Um, then the, uh, the, the, everybody is referring to this um, publication from 2003, a Swiss surgeon called Reinhard Ganz, who dedicated his life to, to, uh, uh, to hip surgery. And he come up I would say, with the modern um, concept of, of femoral uh, acetabular impingement and with the concept of femoral acetabular impingement as a, um, as a cause uh, of osteoarthritis in the younger patients. And you can see here in the schematics a normal hip, and then you have the CAM morphology. I will not call it the lesion because there are a lot of um, um, data out there that you can uh, you can have these uh, these morphologies, these uh, uh, alterations of your normal um, of your normal bone without being symptomatic. So that's why the, the, most of the people prefer to call them morphologies. You have the cam morphology situated on the uh, uh, on on the femoral neck. You have the pincer. Uh, morphology, which is uh, situated at the, the rim of the acetabulum of the acetabular cavity, and then you have the mixed um, morphology, which is both you have a, a cam a cam morphology and the pincer morphology. Um, cam morphology, what it means, it's actually it's a loss of sterosis. That's a difficult word. Sericity of the femoral head. It means it had it. There is a, a decreased head neck ratio. So the the ratio between the diameter uh, of the uh, of the head and the diameter of the femoral neck is um, decreasing, and that um, leaves us um, with the problem that these um, that it impinges the femoral neck impinges against the uh, uh, the rim of the acetabular cavity. Um, these the shear forces while impinging uh, lead to a chondral damage and to delamination of the uh, of the uh, cartilage, and then eventually it will lead to osteoarthritis of the of the hip. Uh, normally, you you can see it uh, a um, a cam morphology or an, an um, FI will normally result in sub supralateral uh, osteoarthritis on the X-ray. Uh, and the labral injury in the CAM morphology, uh, morphology typically occurs in the later stages of the development of the disease. And uh, it is usually in the superior anterior aspect of the femoral neck. And it, it's typically seen in young male athletes. Uh, and that's probably because you, you, um, you, you, you use your range of motion in the hips at the extremes and then you will impinge and eventually you will get uh, damages to the labrum and the, uh, the, um, uh, the cartilage in this region. And then we have the pincer morphology. Uh, it results in, in, uh, in uh, labral injury in the early stages. Uh, you have uh, in the later stages, uh, you will see um, calcification in, in the labral area and the, the uh, development of osteophytes. And this is most commonly seen in middle-aged women. Uh, and the association with the osteoarthritis is not as strong as CAM morphology. And here we have a, a wide spectrum of reasons why the, the pincer morphology, why it occurs. It's a retroversion of the acetabulum, which means that the, the, um, the acetabulum, which normally points a little bit toward the, the, the front side of your body is actually pointing backwards and, and that will um, that will result in an impingement uh, anteriorly and we have an over uh, over coverage anteriorly we have uh, 
than development uh, problems of the hips as the coxa profunda, the coxa var, and the coxa. So hips that are in various uh, hips that are in, in, in valgus. And of course, the, the deep hip where the, uh, the, the, the femoral head is too, too long inside the, the acetabular cavity, and then it will impinge against the, uh, the, um, um, the rim of the acetabulum. Evaluation, it's, it's the evaluation of the hip, it's pretty much the same. Um, these uh, patients will normally um, complain about pain standing, or not so much standing, but sitting and, and pain under specific uh, movements or activities. Uh, the clinical examination, in, in my own experience, I, I, I have really difficulties in, in distinguishing and in, in, in femoral and in FRI from an early arthritis or from other intra-articular um, 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 problems. Uh, because if you do these, uh, you, I'm sure you have heard of these FADIA tests, the tests, uh, the tests where you have the, uh, the hip inflection, adduction, internal rotation, and which is uh, supposed uh, to, to show anterior impingement. I mean, if you have an intraticular um, um, problem in your hip, this will hurt uh, whatever, um, whatever the problem is. And then you have the, the Faber test, which is the, the same test. It's, it's flexion, abduction, external rotation, and it's, it's supposed uh, to show posterior impingement. So I think you have to to uh, to do a thorough examination, and you have to rule out other extraarticular um, problems and other uh, intraarticular problems if you want to 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 come down to the diagnosis of a femoral acetabular impingement. Uh, radiology, it's uh, really important. I think you can come a really long way with an with an X-ray, and you have a centered pelvis, so you will center the X-ray a little bit higher than. In a normal x-ray, you have the cross table views, lateral views, frog views, and it's, it, it depends a little bit on, on, on what, you're looking, what you're looking for. Uh, CT can be useful, and then you have the uh, MRI arthrogram where you actually put some contrast um, liquid into the joint, uh, and this is especially useful for the assessment of the, uh, the labrum of the hip joint. Uh, and this is what it, this is a patient who has an, a moderate osteoarthritis, I would say. You can see the, uh, the, the formation of small cysts here. You can see um, the, the, the subchondral sclerosis of the hip. Uh, but you can also see the loss of the severity if you put a circle uh, onto the, the femoral head. Then you can see that uh, all this is outside the, uh, the sphere, outside the circle. And, and this is the CAM lesion. And then you can see as well that this patient has a combined uh, morphology. There's a little bit of a pincer lesion as well with an osteophyte here and calcification in the area of the labrum. Uh, and and these are, this is a patient who is not yet a candidate for a total hip arthroplasty. He's not a candidate uh, as well for 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 uh, FI surgery because he's showing signs of osteoarthritis and the the results as far as I know are quite uh, um, are quite bad um, for as a doing uh, atroscopic surgery in patients with osteoarthritis um, treatment for symptomatic um, femoral acetabular impingement the surgery uh, if we are talking about surgery we are going to talk about a little bit more conservative surgery, uh, conservative treatment later. The surgery aims to correct hip morphology and achieve impingement-free range of movement. Um, there's a possibility of open surgery, uh, safe surgical dislocation. You have to um, dislocate uh, the hip uh, from its socket without disturbing the, the blood circulation. And then, of course, we have the, the hip uh, atroscopy, which is, um, by all means, the preferred method uh, today for most of uh, the cases uh, of, of femoral acetabular impingement. Uh, I think I have no pictures here because uh, at, at my clinic we are not doing any um, hip atroscopy uh, because I'm, I, I strongly believe that it's, um, these are complex patients with uh, complex um, problems and you should be a um, 
a specialized center with a multicentric approach to these patients because I don't think that it's, it's for most of the patients, it's not uh, sufficient just to, to burn away the CAM lesion. And you maybe have to, uh, you have to uh, repair the labrum. You may or may not have to, to do something with, with other um, structural changes in, in the hip. I mean, if the, the retroversion of the acetabulum is the problem, then you maybe have to do an osteotomy. And so that's, why I think you have to do this this kind of surgery at specialized centers who are doing a lot of these surgeries to get good results. And the results can be good, uh, but they can be quite bad as well. Um, short about development dysplasia of the hip, as you all know, uh, development dysplasia is a, um, um, a, um, a problem of the hip that occurs uh, during the development of the hips. Uh, the x-rays you can see on the, on the, on the left-hand side, you have the two um, femurs without a, um, uh, you, you, can't, you can't see the, the gross um, nucleus of, of the femoral head at three months. Uh, and then th this is a, um, a dysplasia which has not been treated. And then on the next x-ray at 13 months, you can see on the right hip, there is no, um, there is no growth of, there is no femoral head at all. And if you look at the and the configuration of the acetabulum, you can see here it's actually a socket. Here it's more like a flat. It's not even a bowl. And then the, the femoral head is actually missing. And um, this is the, the femoral head is missing because there's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no force. Uh, so in the development of an, an, a natural hip joint, you will need the, the femoral head or the femoral head to be to press in, into the acetabular socket for the socket and the femoral head to develop in a, in a, in a correct way. So uh, development dysplasia of the hip is caused by abnormal mechanical forces and focal areas of gross arrest in the development, in the developing joint. Uh, and it results in inadequate bony coverage of the femoral head. Uh, so there's not, a low, uh, there's not uh, enough acetabular bone covering the femoral head. And this leads to increased uh, forces on the acetabular rim, uh, and that can result in labral injury. And here you can see that all these, um, everything is, is linked together. The, the, the development dysplasia of the hip can lead to labral injury, and this can lead to calcification, and this can lead to impingement problems or the, um, the, the misdevelopment of the, the socket can lead to a retroversion or an overcoverage in, at, at, uh, at the front of the, uh, at the acetabula. And this leads to structural instability, which results in pain. And if it's untreated, if it gets even worse, it will lead to subluxation. And then it will lead to luxation, which hopefully is quite rare today in, in our countries because we have uh, um, like really advanced screening uh, programs uh, for these um, uh, for the children um, in in when they are when they are born. Uh, on the on this X-ray, you can see an adult um, patient with uh, no signs of osteoarthritis. But if you put the um, um, the lateral edge angle on this, you can see at the, the the angle on this side it's much bigger than on this side, and this represents. A, a development dysplasia of the hip. And this patient is complaining, it's a female patient, and uh, she is complaining about pain while standing. She has a structural instability. This uh, X-ray is a patient uh, who came from abroad to Sweden, and they had done some kind of uh, osteotomy on both hips in when she was a child, but she can't really, um, um, she, she has no, she had no idea what was done uh, with her hips when she was a child. But you, as you probably and hopefully can see, uh, these hips are not doing well uh, now and she's only 26 years old. Uh, she, she got uh, bilateral hip uh, um, uh, prosthesis because there's nothing else to do. This is, this is impossible to fix with, uh, with osteotomies. As you can see here, there's no, um, no uh, cartilage at all, and there's a, a gross deformity of both the femoral heads and the sockets. 
And here you have a, a picture of a, a patient, um, a grown-up, an, an adult, actually um, a, a patient um, born in Sweden where the, the screening program must have missed, who has a subluxation of uh, his right hip, demonstrated by this red line, uh, which goes through the center of rotation in his uh, left hip, which is his hip uh, who is working fine. And you can see that uh, he's uh, affected the, the DDA hip is um, much higher here, there's a much higher um, um, center of rotation and this is where the acetabular socket normally uh, should be located and this patient has developed a pseudo acetabulum some centimeters above cranial to the, uh, the normal uh, location of the acetabulum and, and again here there's you can do nothing um, uh, besides an, an, an uh, you can you can do an arthrodesis. You can uh, you can uh, operate his uh, his uh, hip stiff uh, or an, an, an arthroplasty, but there's no there's no possibility to to change back this morphology to a normal morphology. Um, a little bit about the clinical presentation of symptomatic acetabular dysplasia in in adults, uh, and uh, hopefully it's a busy slide. I'm uh, sorry for that, but we can see is. Uh, that most of the patients will experience moderate um, pain. Uh, they will judge their own symptoms as moderate. They will experience uh, pain in the groin and they will experience it at the lateral aspect of the thigh. Uh, and this is a little bit of quality of pain, sharp, dull. It's, it's, uh, it's 76, 78%. It's not really a difference. Uh, activity related uh, that's quite typical for these patients and then a lot of these patients will actually present with uh, a snapping and popping mechanical symptoms in their hip and then the uh, the uh, the pain their problems their symptoms will get aggravated while walking running and standing which is quite typical uh, for these patients the, the ddh patients in contrast to the patients with uh, the the impingement who, who normally will find uh, sitting uh, with their legs flex quite uncomfortable. Um, and then most of the patients will actually, um, as I said, it's an overload of the, of the acetabular rim. Uh, so most, it's an instability problem. Most of these patients will feel relief in rest in contrast to osteoarthritis patients who you often develop uh, pain at rest. Um, and this is just um, how long these patients can walk. Or they, they will, in, if they will uh, use, and and most of these, they're young patients. Most of them will not use any walking aids. Um, the treatment I have been talking about um, um, hip prosthesis, uh, but if you catch these patients in a in earlier stage. Uh, you can do um, in periacetabular osteotomy, where you actually, which is shown on these schematics, you actually um, do uh, osteotomies around the acetabulum until you can rotate the acetabulum freely so that it will uh, increase the coverage of the femoral head without um, causing any impingement and it will reduce the overload of the acetabular rim and it will increase the stability of the hip and uh, these uh, patients will um, experience uh, relief of their symptoms they will have a, a normal range of movement they will can they can back go back to uh, um, to um, to sports activities and and, um, and it, it looks like a really a lot of surgery and it is a lot of surgery but it, it's really working fine in the right patient and now we go to um, osteoarthritis treatment. There is a lot of um, uh, consensus um, uh, publications how we should treat osteoarthritis, and that is um, due to, as I said in the beginning of my talk, uh, there's a lot of uh, patients suffering from osteoarthritis, and it's, it's a huge um, problem uh, for our communities and our countries, and it's a huge cost uh, for, our, for, for our health system. Uh, so we have the American College of Rheumatology and Arthritis Foundation, which has uh, published guidelines in, which are quite uh, thorough in 2019. And then we have the Your Own NICE guidelines, and then we have some guidelines in, 
in Sweden as well, which uh, probably will have to be updated soon there from 2012. And I will go uh, through um, different, um, the, the different conservative treatments um, now. Physical therapy, um, first and foremost, it's uh, not, not, you will see that I used the, the, the word strongly recommended, um, um, moderate recommended, strongly recommended against. This is um, strongly recommended, which means there is a lot of evidence supporting this kind of treatment. Strongly recommended against means there's not sufficient evidence to, to actually recommend these treatment on a bigger scale, which means it, it is not impossible that you will have success with uh, some of, of the treatment options, but there's just not enough evidence to, to, um, to promote it for everybody. Um, I think physical therapy should focus on the patient's preferences and access to um, physical therapy. And the aim, of course, is to reduce symptoms uh, by improving hip stability, neuromuscular control, movement patterns. Uh, and the, uh, the data shows that it's most likely a better effect of physical therapy if the, the, um, the exercises are supervised and if, you have, uh, if it's individual exercises. So you will have better ex effect with individual treatment, the, the physical therapist and the patient compared to group um, treatment. Um, with that meaning that the one should not exclude uh, the, uh, the other, uh, but it is probably so that, that these patients, if you want to be successful in the treatment, that you have to see them um, uh, individually. Um, Christian, could I could I just ask? I've got, I've got a question from Adam Jones. Just saying, could you discuss common patterns of pain referral or location of pain on assessment? Um, your opinion on how far down the leg impingement pain can travel? <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, I think what is. What is normally, um, I think that uh, it's if you experience pain in the groin, a referral on the medial side of the thigh to the medial side of the knee, that's what everybody talks about. It's uh, the obturator nerve that, that refers to the, the, the pain. Um, but I, I mean, down lower than, than the knee, I, uh, I will always more think about a, a lumbar spine pathology uh, like a, a risopathy, a, a radical pathy, um, um, if it's that problem. But I, I think, in my experience, uh, the, everybody says that these patients have have um, pain in their groin, uh, and then you can you can see um, publications where they um, actually do they distinguish from the patient um, pain in the inner groin and in the in the outer part uh, of the groin, but. For me, the, the, the pain location is quite inconsistent. So, so I will say, um, I'm sure you have heard about the, the Z sign that the, the, these patients normally will present with. Uh, they will do something like this and say, "This is where I have my, my, my pain." I'm not sure if that's what you meant, but but the typical pain referral, uh, I would say, from from hip in, in impingement and in in, um, in other intra-articular um, problems is uh, the, the hip area uh, in the buttock uh, and the lateral aspect of the thigh in the groin and then on the medial side of the, the thigh down to the knee uh, and I think if it's something else then you, you, you should think something else as well I mean if, if you can't find anything else then it's still it's possible that the, the, the pain that these patients have pain referral all the way down to the to the uh, to the ankle, um, but I don't think that it's quite it's common. I hope that okay. was. Uh, yeah, no, that was that was very good, very thorough answer. Thank you. Uh, weight loss, um, of course, strongly recommended. There's a lot of of evidence that shows that um, patients, overweight patients with osteoarthritis with um, problems uh, such as femoral impingement and instability problems due to development dysplasia of the hips 
uh, they will uh, have they will experience symptom relief when uh, they can go down in weight it's a dose response which means is the more weight you lose the better you are going to uh, uh, the better it's going to be for you um, and um, the weight loss uh, more than five percent uh, of the body weight increases clinical outcome and the clinical out outcome um, will um, will increase up to more than 20 percent so it's it's not th that these patients that they should um, uh, set be satisfied if they go down five or ten percent so it's it's a quite linear dose response uh, so the more weight you lose the more um, the better the symptoms of the osteoarthritis or the, the the problems the structural underlying problem of course is not going to be um, uh, eliminated by weight loss but what we can do is we can uh, change how the, the patients experience their their pain uh, and it's even an, a better outcome if you combine weight loss together with physical therapy um, we have a little poll here and that's just because I read an interesting in, in preparing for this talk an interesting uh, publication if you have a, um, a, a obese patient uh, do you think that this obese patient should be prescribed physical therapy before or after weight loss do you think you will have a better effect of the physical therapy before or after the the, the weight loss um, okay so we have uh 30 percent uh, of people are, are voting it's going up very quickly so i'll leave it up for a little while So we're up to 60%. I'll leave it on for another 10 seconds. Okay, brilliant. So we're up to up to 75%. So I'll just share those results. So you can see that, um, do, do you think an obese patient should be prescribed physical therapy before or after weight loss? And 72% said before and 28% said after. Got it. What the, the publication said was actually, and I'm 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 fully aware that this is a quite a complex question, and it was two very simple answers. But what this uh, what they said is that they uh, could uh, show in in their research that it actually was better to get the patients to lose weight before physical therapy, because especially when you are grossly overweight, the the physical therapy often uh, will trigger more pain and the, these patients will get uh, frustrated and they will get more um, problems uh, with uh, walking and, and ambulating. Uh, so their recommendation was is to try to, to, to get these patients to lose weight before uh, they actually en en enrolled in physical therapy. But with that said, it, it is a really complex question because it's not uh, as you all I'm, I'm sure you're aware it's not just for these patients to stop eating and then they will uh, lose all their weight there's uh, it's uh, overweight is a is a really complex problem but I think it's it's uh, it's worse to 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 think about it um, when uh, when we talk to our patients that we have to be uh, um, we have to be sensible to the problems that especially these overweight, the, the, the obese patients that they experience when starting um, uh, physical exercise because of their, uh, their massive overload, their joints will be experience um, a lot of more pain um, compared to a patient who is not uh, overweight. Um, tai Chi, I'm, <laughs> I just found this in the, the Americans, uh, obviously they love uh, Tai Chi. And it is, there's obviously a lot of evidence recommending Tai Chi for the treatment of uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, and it's uh, probably because it's a, it's a holistic mind-body practice which in, encompasses uh, relaxation um, and, and breathing exercises. Uh, uh, so I think uh, Tai Chi is, is not a big business in, in Sweden. I have no idea how it is in the UK, but uh, if you have patients and you have the possibility to, uh, <laughs> to send them to uh, or to persuade them to start with Tai Chi, it's obviously a, a good idea.
Self-efficacy and self-management programs, they are strongly recommended. Uh, it's uh, very much about goal setting, problem solving, positive thinking, the patients taking control of, over their problems, stop being a victim. Um, it's strongly recommended. It's mostly strongly recommended because it's, it's of course, minimal risk for the patients, but in general, it's small effect sizes um, with this. Uh, the same is um, um, with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, CBT. It has shown a lot of positive effects in chronic pain, health-related quality of life, fatigue, negative, negative mood, and all these are side effects of, of osteoarthritis, but there's limited evidence. Walking aids, they are strongly recommended. Um, there is a compliance problem that at least I hear very often. There's, um, I think I have a, a lot, I do have a lot of prob um, patients who actually um, are quite happy with their walking aids, um, but then I have equally the equally amount of patients who um, who think um, it's kind of a social stigma um, if they have to to go um, outside with a cane or walk, and then people will see them as as old. And and so I'm 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 trying to to um, uh, to persuade my patients to use two uh, walking poles. And, and to, to do uh, like the, the classic power walking um, and, and to try to get them into to that. But the cane and a walker is, is actually quite good, especially in older patients when the walking, when the ambulation is in, impaired. Um, braces, um, um, a little connection to us here. They are strongly recommended um, both in the UK and in the US, not in Sweden yet, um, for the, the treatment of tibiofemoral uh, osteoarthritis conditionally recommended, and that means there's uh, not so much evidence in the treatment of patellofemoral osteoarthritis. Uh, there is an, an obvious lack of evidence in, uh, for these patients, uh, for, for braces, for hip osteoarthritis. In my own, and I have to admit, it's very limited experience with uh, the, the hip um, um, braces. The compliance is the main problem. It, it works, but the, the patients, they, they use the, the braces for a short amount of time and, and then they will not use them anymore because it's just too too bulky too too it's 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 too uh, difficult for them to put them on insoles wedges modified shoes there's very very limited evidence and it's um it, that's mostly because it's really unclear what is the best type and they have been there's a, a big lack of evidence uh, but it's most likely very beneficial with optimal footwear. I think that um, patients with osteoarthritis should not uh, go with uh, with uh, Crocs or with sandals. They should have uh, um, optimal footwear with a with a good heel grip and a, a, a good dampening in in their soles. Uh, acupuncture is conditionally recommended. There is a large number of trial and it's widely used. Uh, but there is um, a big controversy regarding the efficacy of, of acupuncture uh, for pain relief in these patients. But again, we're talking about evidence. I'm sure there is a lot of patients who actually get uh, good health uh, and pain relief from acupuncture. Um, TENS, it's uh, strongly recommended against, and that's uh, due to poor evidence, and there's most likely no, uh, no measurable benefit for osteoarthritis patients. And then, <coughs> sorry, we have the pharmacological management. Uh, and I think it's, it's, um, it's good to start and recommend to these patients uh, to start with the topical NSID, um, like the, the gels that they can put on their knees and their hips. And, and there's, uh, I don't think there's much effect, but I think there's a, a um, a really good placebo effect of these and then they will experience some some warmth and, and heat and and yeah and they're doing something on this uh, paracetamol is um, strongly recommended even if the effect on pain um, um, caused by osteoarthritis is uh, not as strong as um, with n or cox2 inhibitors um, um, medication uh, and you can see what I was trying to to show with this uh, slide is that topical NSAIDs you can have the occasional rash from from the uh, from the use but then the side effects will uh, go up and uh, here you have tramadol and then even above that you will have morphine which I think should be uh, spared for only the, the patients 
who you don't want to operate on because I mean we can't we can't create uh, morphine uh, addicts uh, just to uh, uh, to treat osteoarthritis. You have the uh, the intraticular glucocorticoid in in injections. They are strongly recommended. There's a lot of evidence, and that's probably. Um, there's a lot of evidence um, regarding pain relief, uh, and that's because the, the, the uh, glucocorticoids, the corticoids, addresses the synovitis and the capsulitis inside the uh, inside the joint. Um, but for the hip joints, the ultrasound or X-ray guidance is needed. Uh, and then there is a big question about the dose: how much should I give, and how frequent? Should I give my my uh, cortisone uh, my my cortical um, injections uh, myself, which is more like a guess? I normally do it two max three times, and and then I will not do it more because there is evidence that the frequent usage uh, contributes to cartilage loss. So it it actually it, it will make the problem worse over in the long run. Platelet-rich plasma, I think it's probably the same um, in the UK as it is in, in, in Sweden. It, it pretty much pops, uh, pops up uh, everywhere. I did a simple Google search where I searched for uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma treatment, and I found a lot of references of vampire treatment, and you could treat hair loss and skin enhancement and uh, pimples, and, and then uh, there was uh, a lot of um, orthopedic... Um, surgeons um, uh, doing uh, 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 they, they said they can uh, they can use a PRP uh, pretty much regardless any diagnosis they will actually um, um, inject a PRP everywhere and if one looks at the the um, um, the literature um, what what kind of evidence is there and then and that's actually all the guidelines, the US guidelines, your NICE guidelines, and our Swedish guidelines that actually are strongly recommended against the use of platelet rich plasma for the indication of osteoarthritis. And it's a big concern regarding the heterogeneity uh, of, uh, of the patients and, and the lack of standardization of available preparations. We pretty much have no idea what we actually are injecting uh, into uh, these, into the joints. Uh, so um, th there may be there are some um, companies or there's one company that I know of that that are trying to to they have some white papers out now, and it's it's a little bit promising that they can uh, get an an uh, a lasting um, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, effect of of their um, PRP. Uh, um, injections but I, I still for the the use outside of studies and in the use outside of of uh, of university centers i i think we should be careful in using it but we because we actually we we really don't know what we're doing when we in, inject uh, prp into into joints and then this is just a list with the strongly recommended uh, against where there's a total lack of evidence uh, hyaluronic acid injections is strongly recommended against even if myself I have had patients who have had great effects but the evidence says otherwise it's it's uh, don't do it glucosamine um, as um, uh, as, uh, as tablet as oral medication don't do it there's no evidence at all and there's a lot of evidence uh, against it then more um, um, more modern um, way of thinking, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors and interleukin-1 receptor antagonists, which are actually, uh, the, the thought is that they will uh, try to uh, to stop and they will try to interact with the degradation of the protein glucanes, which I pro talked about at the beginning of the talk, but there still there's not much evidence that this is. Uh, chondroitin, uh, it's not recommended. Metotrexate, um, it's not recommended. Bisphosphonates, not recommended. And then more um, vitamin D, fish oil, botulinum, it's strongly recommended against. Um, 
A total hip replacement. I, I have to mention it as a, as a treatment. It has been called the operation of the century and it is actually a, a very good operation for, for a lot of patients, uh, probably not for all the younger ones, uh, but it is uh, a, a, an operation with uh, reproducible um, outcomes, very good outcomes. Um, and even for, for younger patients with modern materials, I think we can, um, with good conscience now, um, um, recommend the hip arthroplasty even to these patients. Uh, sport after hip uh, replacement. There's uh, another short, uh, what do we say? Uh, this is, the, now I'm, I'm always done with my talk. Um, what do we say to our patients after total hip replacement? Uh, what do you think? Um, uh, Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. Bear with me a second. Uh, so you should be able to see that now. Um, so what do we tell our patients? Uh, can you go back to sports after a total hip replacement? Yes or no? And if you click that, then click next. And there's another question after that, which we'll come to in a moment. Uh, so the second question is, should our patients go back to sport? So we have 60% of people uh, have answered that. So we'll give it another few seconds just because there's uh, two questions in that. Uh, a few people have commented that it, it depends on the sport, <laughs> which I suppose is a, a, a very good point, Christian. That's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just going to end the polling there. So we've got solid 70% uh, have answered. So effectively, um, what do we tell our patients? Can you go back to sports after a total hip replacement? 96% have said yes. Uh, and 92% and, uh, have said should our, our patients should, yes, go back to sport. Yeah, I, I totally agree with all of you, um, of course. But I have to say, at least in Sweden, I think if we had asked these, um, this, this question 15 years ago to, to, uh, uh, to ultraplasty surgeons in Sweden, most of them would have said no. Um, that's probably because we're a really conservative country here. Um, but I think um, um, that we should say yes today. Uh, there's... there's Data showing that as much as 35% of patients listed for total hip replacement are involved in sports. And uh, return to sports is potent potentially a major expectation after a total hip replacement. And that's really true, at least in, in my practice here with uh, an, an overweight of patients under the age of 65 and 60, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm doing hip replacements on. And there is evidence that shows we have higher outcome scores for patients returning to sport after the hip replacement. And there is evidence that shows there's a reduced risk for cardiovascular diseases if our patients return to sports. And then the next question, should they? Um, activity level is one of the most important patient-related factors, influence and prosthetic wear. And prosthetic wear meaning we are influencing the, uh, the, the patency, the, uh, the lifetime of the prosthesis in a negative way. Uh, there's the high impact sports showing the highest wear rates and they are the sports requiring um, a range of motion at the extreme may increase the risk for um, a dislocation. Um, and then we have uh, here, uh, th this should be on the, uh, should have been on the slide before, we have the sports with exposure to high torque forces as downhill skiing and tennis, and even they will increase uh, the risk for, for fractures and for um, uh, polyethylene wear, polyethylene being the, the new, um, the, uh, the articulating surface of the hip prosthesis. Um, and this is, an, an, um, this is actually this uh, return to sports activity after total hip arthroplasty, a survey of members of the British Hip Society. Uh, and this is also, this is surgeons uh, answering questions about what they think. And uh, I have to say, there is not much uh, evidence out there that actually support, this is expert opinion, you, you can call it. All these uh, surgeons have said that they have a special interest in operating on patients younger with high um, functional demands. 
uh, and you can say low impact sports and that you win in, with the pole such as golf, swimming, walking, cross training, static cycling. Um, most of the uh, of the, the the surgeons will allow their patients cycling, hiking. They will allow it, and then we go to to a little bit more intermediate um, sports. You have uh, weightlifting, and then you have to think weightlifting is uh, is that what we mean by weightlifting um, or training at at the gym with weights? I mean, there's a big difference, and I think training at the gym. With, with moderate weights and uh, a high number of repetitions is no problem, but, but uh, like, like really heavy weightlifting, I, I strongly recommend against uh, for my patients. And then we have, of course, the, um, the contact sports as football and, and uh, handball, things like that, and then the martial arts um, being prone to, on the one hand side, you are, you are testing the prosthesis at the at the edge of the uh, or at the the outer range, the outer rim of the range of motion of the prosthesis, and then you actually you can't control in a contact sport. I mean, you have the opponents, you have the, in 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 soccer, in in handball, you have the other um, running against you, being able to uh, um, to to injure you. Um, skiing, um, ski, skiing downhill, skiing is a big thing in, in, in Sweden and uh, uh, most of, of the patients uh, that's at least my experience they will not uh, they will not listen to me uh, if they can go downhill skiing they will go downhill ski uh, regardless what I say what I tell them um, and just a question from a lot earlier uh, Mr. Ingle just uh, from Ian Byrne just saying uh, there's recent research suggesting running can be protective against OA, delay uh, acceleration of the condition. Do you recommend uh, against running in your OA patients? Um, I, I, I do. What I, in my experience is that the, the hip OA patients, that they, will, they are not doing well running. I mean, I have the occasional patient who has quite severe osteoarthritis and they keep on running and that, that's fine for me. I'm, I'm not stopping that. But in my experience, most of my patients, they, they will just, they will, if, if you, the patient seeks me and I refer the patients to a, a physical therapist. And then my, my idea of, of rehab uh, to avoid um, an, an, a surgical uh, intervention is that the patient, when he sees me or the physical therapist is somewhere here. And then the, 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 physic, the level of physical activity should be like a linear, a linear increase. So he should gradually increase the, the, the level of activity. And the patients, that's at least my experience, and there's no, there's no evidence behind it. But my experience is the patients who, who, who want to run and start running, the rehab is very much like this. They will, they will run and then they will experience more pain and then they get frustrated and then they think that the, the, the physical therapy doesn't help and then they, they start running again and then they will experience more pain. So that's what I say is if, if, you, if you're not being a runner before the symptoms of your osteoarthritis, don't, don't try to do it. That's what, what, I, what I tell them. But I'm, I'm sure that if you're a better um, a better teacher than I am and, and you spend a little bit more t time with the patients that you can actually get them to to uh, by walking uh, start running on a treadmill start running uphill you can actually get them to 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 run but, but my experience is just that it's 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 really difficult for these patients if they are not used if they're not like really um, how do you call it uh, if they're not runners before Yes, it has to be, yeah, it has an effect on their uh, uh, return. Yes, okay, understood, thank you. And I think this is one of my last slides, it's just when do we think uh, we should let people return to sport? In this, uh, the, the British surgeons, they say somewhere between three and uh, six uh, months. Um, there's, uh, from data from the US, they, they are more, more conservative, but they have a different system they are trying to avoid uh, complications. Uh, so the, the most of the American surgeons, 
at least what I read, will say six months. Most of the European surgeons will say three months. And again, it depends very much on the, uh, on the patient and on the sport. But I, I will normally allow my patients somewhere between three to four months to, to uh, go back to sports. Um, Thank you. Uh, this is uh, the Trail Forks map of the area where I live. There's a lot of good mountain biking, so hopefully I will take a, a short ride this evening and there's a really a beautiful uh, nature uh, around um, Stockholm. So thank you for listening, uh, everybody, even uh, if it was a little bit long, maybe. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we, we, we have uh, a, f a few questions. Um, so we, we have a lot more uh, and I won't go, won't go through every single one, but I'll aim to, uh, aim to, to answer a few of these as we, as we go on. Um, one of the questions was, um, just finding it here, bear with me a second. Um, do, do you see uh, experience uh, in amputees? Do you perhaps see more hip pathologies perhaps than you might in, the, in a non-amputee population? Is that something that you've seen in the past? Um, yeah, I, I, have to, I have very limited um, experience because we have, um, as you probably know, we have, uh, we have no, um, there are very few amputees in, in, in Sweden due to that we, have, we don't have military out in the world um, um, fighting wars and we, don't, we have very, very few traffic accidents in, in Sweden due to all the, the big Volvo cars uh, which a lot of safety and then you are not allowed to go faster than 20 miles per hour in Sweden. So, so I, have, I, I, must, I have very limited in, in, in experience because we have so few younger amputees in, in Sweden. So I, I have to say, I don't know. Okay. All right. Uh, so good, good also question that one was. Apologies for that. <laughs> um, uh, there are a few others. Um, do you, do you normally have any movement restrictions immediately following a total hip replacement? What's your sort of post-operative protocol with regards to that? I, I, I do operate through a posterior approach and I have no restrictions. I, I thoroughly test my, my, uh, um, my hip prosthesis on the table before they're leaving the, the theater. And if there's no, there's no obvious problem, I will not have any restrictions at all. And I think there's a lot of evidence, uh, as far as I know out there, that, that says that the restriction have very limited effect on the dislocation rates. I mean, okay. then you can have the, uh, it can have a positive effect on, on patients' education and things like this. But there's, there have been difficulties in showing that the, the, the post-operative restrictions have effect on dislocation rates. Okay. So I don't have any restrictions uh, if I'm not, if, I, if I'm comfortable with my result of the surgery. And right. I don't have, sometimes I have restriction if I have patients with uh, neurological disorders or, or patients where I may, uh, um, my, where I may uh, have a suspicion on, on bad compliance or something like this, but, but uh, otherwise I don't have. Okay, and there's, there's quite a lot of questions about active patients. Uh, there's a question from Karen Ross, uh, just saying, if you've got an active sports person, um, when would you consider resurfacing as opposed to, to full arthroplasty? <laughs> I actually took away the pictures about the, the resurfacing. I think we, we, we stopped doing resurfacing in, in Sweden a couple of years ago because of the complications, as you probably know. Um, but in, in the UK, especially the Birmingham group, has shown excellent results and they're popping up more and more articles now, more and more evidence that uh, the resurfacing has superior functional outcomes compared to a conventional hip arthroplasty. Uh, so I would uh, say, I mean, you have Andy Murray in, in England winning an ATP tournament nine months after his uh, hip resurfacing. Um, so I think that uh, if, we would have the possibility in Sweden, uh, the young male active patients with a big femoral head, because this is one of the, the, the risk factors for failure of, of hip resurfacing, it doing it on, on, on small, uh, on small um, femoral heads, uh, which increases the risk for a vascular necrosis under the head, because then you're disturbing the, the blood supply. 
um, I was saying, but then you have to have a thorough discussion with your patient because the evidence at the moment is still so that you have an, a higher risk. If you do a resurfacing, you have a higher risk of um, uh, revision uh, compared to a conventional uh, arthroplasty. Um, so you have to be very, you have to be discussing this thoroughly with your patients that he probably, like he has a higher um, chance of getting an, a superior functional result with a hip resurfacing, but on the other hand, he has a higher risk of revision um, under his lifetime if he is doing a, a hip resurfacing. Okay, um, and is it? Do you, do you think it's common that people with a chronic uh, with chronic hip pain end up with an inconclusive diagnosis? Um, you know, either the cause of the pain is perhaps not clear. Is it? What are your uh, thoughts on that? I think we're getting better uh, at it, but I think the, all the, uh, the the diagnosis, the possible diagnosis that I listed at the beginning. Uh, I think it's it's really difficult to 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 um, to verify these diagnoses because um, as probably we're doing a lot of MRI on on symptomatic hips and we actually didn't we do not find anything. Sometimes we see a little bit of a trochanteric uh, bursitis. Sometimes we see a, a, a piriformis tendonitis, but most often we we don't see anything, and it's it's. It's probably that these patients are somewhere in these borderline areas between all of these. Uh, they have a, a kind of an overload in, in, in the bone and they have um, uh, inflammation and, and um, uh, overstrain of, of muscles and tendons. Um, but that's. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I think. Just, that, go ahead, sorry. No, no, um, sorry. Um, and then just perhaps one, one last question, because we've, uh, we've had quite a long session here, but I think this is interesting from a, a Swedish perspective, but um, had, uh, Sarah Brooker asked, uh, unrelated to this talk, but in the current climate, um, just wondering what operating schedules for elective surgeries, uh, are they normal at present for you? Uh, what's the situation? Um, at our, I'm, I'm at a private hospital. What, what the, um, the NHS has done here is uh, they have left us with our staff and that's, that's uh, uh, the anesthetist uh, the, the, um, anesthetist staffs and they have um, we are doing um, now like normal not elective normal um, orthopedic surgery trauma surgery in, in, in our theaters. Uh, and then we have a, a really a small amount of, of our elective uh, patients that we can operate on one, one day a week. Uh, and, and that's because we at our hospital, we don't, we don't participate in the, in the corona um, treatment at all. So we, we just, uh, we have, um, um, we just have um, healthy patients without uh, symptoms. But with that said, as you probably know, we are testing not nearly as much as the other countries in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, especially the, the UK. And there's uh, more and more evidence that probably um, the, uh, the um, uh, how do you call it, the, the um, um, we will, the transmission of, of the virus uh, is, is probably much bigger among uh, unsymptomatic um, patients or people than that what we anticipated uh, in the beginning. Uh, but yeah. most, uh, of, go ahead, most of the elective surgery has been cancelled in, in, in Sweden. In, in the Swedish equivalent to the NHS, there's no elective surgery and then there are some private clinics as ours, they have like really tiny, uh, um, a little bit of surgery left. Co correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why this is today is because you were in surgery yesterday, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's interesting to know. Um, so that really concludes uh, the, the main talk for today. Um, I do have one last poll, um, and uh, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Christian Ingle before we do that. Uh, 
fascinating talk, uh, really in depth, and we, we have lots of outstanding questions that we don't really have time to go uh, to all of those today, but we'll do our best to, to, to get those uh, to Mr. Ingle, and if we can't get, can get answers, we will do. Um, I have one last poll, uh, which I would like to, to just ask. Um, and basically this relates to um, further webinars uh, that we're having. So what time would best suit you for having for, uh, further webinars uh, once restrictions start to ease? Obviously we're getting more information from all countries about restrictions easing and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we've had all of ours at two o'clock. Um, obviously the one this week um, with Mr. Ingle was on a Thursday where normally we have a Wednesday. I'll come to this more in a moment, but actually next week's is, is on Monday, so relatively soon. But what, what time is suitable for you uh, for us to do uh, these webinars? So between 9 and 11, 12 and 2, or 3 and 5? Um, so I'm just going just gonna, to uh, stop that, and then I'll, I'll keep those results and have a look at those uh, for later. Um, Really, it just, just remains to, uh, to, to close the session. Uh, say thank you to, to Mr. Christian Ingle uh, for a fascinating talk. Um, I'd also like uh, to, to, to suggest that you um, enroll and register for the one next week, uh, which is a talk from Mr. Adil Adjued um, on uh, multi-ligament trauma knees, a conservative treatment pathway. Um, a very fascinating insight into how you can use conservative measurements uh, measures uh, in order to treat multi-ligament trauma needs. Um, also, uh, it's important to note that as a, as a company, uh, OSA, we're still we're still here. We're still available, and our and our supply lines are, are relatively unaffected by uh, the current situation. So, if you have any questions, if you have any 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 needs or any uh, deliveries that you require, we are here to help you, and our customer care teams and sales teams are are here to help you if you need to. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, if you have registered today, uh, you should uh, actually receive uh, a link to sign up for the new one. Um, it's also available on, on LinkedIn as well. Uh, but you can always contact eventsne at osa.com for any inquiries and we can send that directly to you. Thank you very much and we will see you on uh, Monday.